Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Open Forum 2013. This is a very special place, and it is, I think, an exciting program we have this year. So a program that we offer in parallel to the annual meeting with the opportunity to really get the dialogue and you get into the discussion with leaders of the world from the public, the private uh, world, but also the civil society and art. Now, there's numerous people that come from the region of Davos, from Davos, the town, but a lot of students, not now at lunchtime, but uh, this evening you will see, uh, members of uh, foundations that come regularly every year to these sessions. So we really get an incredible mix of an audience in the open forum. Let me just tell you what is new this year at the open forum. New is, of course, the website for all those who already discovered this, a new website that allows you really to get an overview, but also to have access to Twitter and to blogs. And I see people blogging here and Twittering, so that they, they're very active. We have much more media presence this year. All sessions are directly televised this year and are distributed by Eurovision. And what we have new that is, and you may be happy for the coming sessions, an overflow room. So if really we don't have, we have more than 300 people, we have a room right next door where you could stay and you have a big screen and you can participate, including coming in and ask questions. So you're really part of, it's not somewhere else, you are just next door, and if you have a question, you come in and you get the microphone and participate. And what we have is new too, is a lot of shapers and young global leaders that are part this year too. I think it is an incredibly attractive program. And it's attractive, obviously, for the public if I see the numbers of the last few years because we always had like 3,000 and more people coming to the open forum. But it's interesting also that it becomes more and more attra attractive for speakers. And I just met the, somebody of the media and said, it's incredible that this year we have a lot of speakers that asked us if they could come to the open forum and be on the panel. And I think it is interesting because it shows you that they obviously love to be on this open forum panel, that they want to be part because it is, you know, they want to discuss with the students, the population, the people of the region, the visitors here, and of course the people that are at the annual meeting. What are the topics and, that we have today and what are the speakers? And I want to quickly run through what we decided this, this year to offer. And when I say we, I mean the advisory board, where we have representatives of the International Red Cross, of the Federation of the Swiss Protestant Churches, of the politics, in, so I would say the Bern uh, politicians, the Bankers Association, NGOs, or a group of uh, anti-corruption organization that is involved with us. And of course, uh, the team. So I speak to you as the responsible managing director at the World Economic Forum. My name is Gilbert Probst. But behind me and the, the doers are, in fact, of course, ladies you see, you probably met at the entrance, uh, Petra and um, Tiffany, and most importantly, Salima Benjanero, who designed this program. And I want to say thank you to this team because they did a great job. So I will not say much about today because Esther will introduce our, the team and the topic, but that we have the NGOs as a topic, the role, the new models, the questions of accountability, there's a good reason for this. The NGOs, the NGOs have developed a lot in the last five to 10 years. You know that they are a natural stakeholder also at the annual meeting, very present, they professionalized a lot, but with that comes the question, 
Should they be run like, like companies? Who is accountable? And I think these are a lot of topics that she will pick up today with the panelists. Tonight, you have, I think, a topic that is, well, it's all over in Europe, in the world uh, uh, topic. If you have read the Tagesanzeiger in Switzerland today, you probably saw that it is the topic now with the announcement that in Spain they are now at 25% plus unemployment, 50% of the youth. And this is something that um, we will pick up. Questions like, how come that young people are three times as often as adults to be unemployed today? 75 million young people look for a, a job worldwide. Many adults lost their job. And at the same time, you have protests on, uh, for other, against unemployment. But you also have, obviously, companies that say they don't find the right people for their jobs available. This is something that we will pick up. And I think we have a great panel tonight with Sharon Burrow, the General Secretary of the International Trade Interna uh, Organization, Chris um, Gopalakrishnan, who is who comes from Infosys, a company that is extremely active in creating jobs in India, or Frederick Reinfeldt, the Prime Minister of Sweden. Thursday, tomorrow, we look into the mega sporting events. Who has an interest in mega sporting events? Who benefits? Who pays for it? What happens to the infrastructure at the end? I mean, these are questions that we have to ask all over the world when you have the football events where 715 million watched, for instance, the World Cup, uh, when you think of the Olympics or car racing. And I'm really happy to have Jean-Claude Beaver of Hublot back. You know that they are very much involved in sponsoring. Uli Maurer, of course, as the president of Switzerland. And Peter Sauber, who everybody knows him from the car racing. I'm sure that the people of Davos have a, quite an interest in the region because you all talk about Olympics here uh, in the future. In the evening, we do something that is very special and different, live sessions from jazz, where you learn about creativity and interaction and collaboration and leadership with one of the top musicians. Chris uh, Washburn is one of the best trombone players in the world but he's also a professor at Columbia University at the School of Art Music, and he's a fantastic speaker. Friday, is religion outdated? A question that comes up more and more. 80% of the people in the world say they are affiliated to, re to religion. But then the question comes, are there clashes between the religions? Are we going to into domination? Or do we really have a multi-religion society in the future? Shapers that will be there as today, by the way, and I'm glad to have young people on the stage. Shaper, um, youth present on the stage. Carol Kayan, who is the president and CEO of the Catholic Health Association. Or Sulak Sivadresna, who is from Thailand, who was twice nominated for the Nobel Prize. In the evening, Eurozone, and I don't think I have to talk about the Euro and the Eurozone and the problems we're in, but amazing is that you get the ministers of economics and finance of Italy, Spain, Belgium, Germany, and the Secretary General of the OECD. I think we can't go do better for panels on this. Saturday, we will talk about a very sad and not enough known uh, topic called obesity, the fastest growing chronic disease in the world. The fastest growing disease in the world. 2.8 million adults die every year of, of, based on the obesity. Uh, you have 1.5 billion people in the world uh, that are overweight and it is growing very fast. And I think I look for really forward to A, the academia, represented by Linda Fried from the Columbia University with her research on this, and Paul Balki, the CEO of Nestle, and many other speakers. So I think a fantastic program ahead of us I'm sure you will love it. Please make it really a dialogue from your side. And I hand over to Esther for the first topic. Thank you very much, Esther, and thank you to the panel.
Grüezi miteinander. That's about all I'll say in Swiss German. But before I introduce the panel, I'd, I'd like to introduce the audience. Our goal is indeed to engage in a discussion, not simply a bunch of speeches. So among you, how many of you live in Davos? Raise your hands. How many live in Switzerland? Okay. How many of you are work for a company or, or in a profitable business? How many of you work for a nonprofit company? And you, you can raise your hand more than one time. How many of you are students? Press? Okay, a few press. We will try to be quotable and clever. Uh, how many of you are forum participants? And how many of you work for governments? Okay, so it's a pretty, pretty diverse bunch. How many speak English? I guess everybody without a Kopfhörer. How many? Und wer spricht Deutsch? Okay, good. So what I'd like to do is start out and ask each of the panelists to introduce him or herself very briefly. The topic today is models for NGOs. There's, there's not a single model, just as businesses have different models, what they do and how they charge for it. NGOs perhaps come in three big buckets, the ones who deliver services, the ones who advocate for somebody else to do something, often for governments to do something, or sometimes in the case of health, for people to eat better so that we solve the problem of obesity. Uh, and then ones that operate as watchdogs, watching other people. Uh, obviously, there is overlap, and we may, during this discussion, come up with some other models. But we'd like to talk about that and who these NGOs are accountable to. Uh, a business is traditionally accountable to its owners, but it's also accountable to its employees. Uh, so is an NGO in the end. So that's the framework in which each member on stage will introduce themselves. Then I'll ask a couple of questions, and then if you start waving your hands, I'll stop and you can begin. So we'll, we'll go in this direction because David Nabarro asked to be near the end, so we'll start with Ken Roth of Human Rights Watch. Thank, thank you, Esther. Um, Is it working? Can you hear me? There. No, that's working. Okay. Um, thank you. I, my name's Ken Roth. I'm the director of Human Rights Watch, which is a global international human rights organization. We work in about 90 countries around the world. And our business, in a sense, is to hold governments as well as businesses accountable to international human rights standards. Um, people also ask, you know, well, to whom are we accountable as an organization? Um, and we find that um, in order for you know, either an NGO or a government to be accountable, you know, step one is you have to know what they're doing. Um, so step one is a, is a question of transparency at some level, access to information about the conduct that you're going to be assessing. And we're going to be really brief. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I'll, I'll, yeah, you have to be accountable to your moderator, first okay, of all. I, I, okay. I guess I can only introduce myself. We'll come back to this later. Anyway, more later on. Hi, um, my name is Amit, Amit Garg. I'm a shaper, global shaper from the San Francisco hub. Um, I am a technologist. I work in Silicon Valley. Uh, I used to be at Google for many years, uh, venture capital, just left to do a startup. But I'm here today in my capacity as, as a founder and um, I guess executive director of my nonprofit. We have built a crowdsourced and crowdfunded hospital in rural India. We just finished it about a month ago. And so you are in this, the delivery business with this hospital primarily? Um, I guess, I, I, I would say in the infrastructure building. Because yeah, but you're delivering a service or building a building. I mean, you're not advocating for the government to run hospitals, you're running one yourself. That's right, that's yeah. right, that's right. And to whom are you accountable? Who pays your bills? And would, if you do something bad, who will stop you? Um, I'm accountable first and foremost to society, but most specifically to my donors. Uh, I have a huge base of donors. My average donor maybe gave me 10 or $20, but I have had donors have given me 20000 
Um, and I would say I'm accountable also very specifically to my partners. Uh, I've, we have built this effort by connecting with a lot of other different organizations and every other organization has given us a little piece. So that keeps us all in checks and balances. And to go back to what Ken said, transparency. You, are you on a website? How do people know what you're doing? Oh yeah, for everybody here on a smartphone, go to hospitalforhope.org. We also have a Facebook group, we also have a Twitter account. Uh, we have leveraged social media and we are very transparent. Our work, our photos, everything is posted. Okay. Um, anybody can email us or reach out anytime and ask us questions. And so yeah. I would say there's really one kind of outfit missing on this panel, which is the press because the press provide transparency from the outside. And if, you, if your hospital went rogue and it started producing pictures that weren't true and actually you were beating your patients or something, there's, I mean, whatever. It's just worth keeping all this in mind. Is, you know, Self-generated transparency is different from external transparency, uh, which is why we have watchdogs, which leads us to Charlotte. Hello, my name is Charlotte Pietigonitska. I'm the Director General of the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency. That was my two minutes. Uh, in short, SIDA. Uh, I have a background in the NGO sector, both in Save the Children in Sweden and internationally, as well as in Red Cross. Cooperation, development cooperation, it's important to stress cooperation. So working with NGOs and enabling NGOs to work in countries are at heart of what we do, but we want to challenge NGOs uh, to really think through their role for the future and to dare to think about exit strategies. We support media because we try to, to enable societies to build institutions and media is so, in, is so important as a watchdog. So it's part of what we do. And I think we will come back to how we want to discuss the NGOs further. So I'll stop there. Okay, and this notion of exit strategy is very interesting. We'll come back to that as well. Uh, Naidu. Hello, everybody. My name is Kumi Naidu. Uh, I'm from Africa. I'm the head of Greenpeace globally. Um, I am wanting I'm to take a phrase from Charlotte. Uh, wanting to challenge NGOs, I'm partly here to challenge governments and businesses for largely paying lip service to the important role of civil society, when in fact, to a large extent, governments and business actually only value the service delivery role of uh, NGOs, but don't actually really uh, embrace the more important role of advocacy, challenging governance, and so on. And I should just say uh, one personal thing, which is I'm uh, I got a lot of my uh, training, early training from within the South African liberation struggle and joined the NGO sector in South Africa after Mandela was elected. And after the first democratic elections in South Africa, so many people moved from the NGO sector to government that we jokingly used to say at that time the term NGO in the South African context no longer stood for non-governmental organization, but stood for next government official. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, David? Uh, yes, example. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm a medical doctor. I worked for my first five years uh, uh, in NGOs uh, in Asia mostly. Then I went to university and taught. Then I went into government. And now I'm in the United Nations. My passions are equity and sustainability. My current work is to make... Uh, the international system work better on agriculture, food, nutrition, and health. And in terms of personal accountability, I report to Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General, but we frequently have debates as to whether our primary accountability is to the 192 governments that are members of the UN, or as it says in the UN Charter, to the people of the world. I have one small point that I think some of the current challenges faced by global governance uh, may be because civil society and social movements have not been involved in governance. And so I'm particularly involved now in models of global governance that involve social movements, civil society, non-governmental groups within the proper governance structure. Yeah, so what do you do when there's a bad government that's one of the governments you're accountable to? 
Well, that's, you see, in a way, where our let-out clause is, because our fundamental accountability, wherever you are in the international system, is to people. And the going back to the UN Charter, it is about equity of people's development. Increasingly, it's also been coming to include equity for future generations, so we're also focused on environmental sustainability. But absolutely, that is the continuous challenge that we're working in, and one that I relish. I think these kinds of difficult challenges is what we're all expected to do in our system. Okay, and finally, Jim Roth. Just Ken Roth is the one who is not listed in your list of speakers, and Jim is the one who is. Thanks, Esther. Um, I run a, uh, a, a profit with purpose private equity fund, $135 million private equity fund uh, that makes investments in uh, businesses that supply insurance to low-income people in, in Africa and Asia. Uh, and we invest in businesses that provide quality, relevant and affordable products uh, to, to, to their customers and treat their stakeholders uh, decently. Um, my, my background is uh, similar to, to, to Kumi's. I, I started off in an NGO. I founded uh, an NGO that worked in South Africa on, on, f on, on the rights of, of farm workers in South Africa and then uh, moved to the UN. Uh, and, and it was part of my experience uh, working in, in NGOs that sort of led me to, to, to pursue and, and, and co-found uh, LeapFrog, some of the challenges that, 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 that I experienced working in uh, the, the, the non-profit sector. And to whom are you accountable? Um, I'm accountable to, to our stakeholders, the, the, the principal stakeholder, of course, our, our investors. Um, and our investors, in our particular case, have, have both uh, a commercial and social, uh, make commercial and social demands of us. And so, I mean, that's a difficult one. Do they say, we'll take less profit so that you can be no. nice to people, or how no, do they, they do that? No, they, they don't, and, and, and we don't. So we're, we're enormously focused on, on, on making private, private equity-style returns, and that's, that's tremendously important to us and a very central part of our philosophy. W what we want to do is achieve impact at scale, uh, and we believe that the only way that you can really achieve impact at very significant scale is if you... Uh, you know, unlock the gates of the capital markets. So, you know, for example, if you took all the biggest foundations uh, and, and, and you added them together and you distributed the amounts that these, the world's largest foundations have and you, you distributed it amongst low-income people in the world, everybody would have a few dollars for a few days. Uh, but in, you know, in the capital markets in, in, in London and New York, there are absolutely vast pools of capital that could be entirely transformative. Uh, and the only way that we can really unlock those uh, is by providing the kinds of returns that those investors would like. Uh, and, and we found businesses, and I'm happy to describe them, uh, that both do, do, do social good, that treat their stakeholders fairly and decently, and that are, are, are profitable at, at a private equity scale. So in theory, you're actually just a model for a decent, accountable business that doesn't exploit its customers rather than... <laughs> I, in essence, okay. yes. I think that's a, that's, a, that's, a fair, that's a fair description. So does anybody want a second crack at the bat? Or then I'm going to ask a little more. Yeah, go ahead, Kumi. I just want to <clears throat> enter this conversation about NGO accountability, which mm -hmm. uh, is on the table. Um, there are sometimes people who say, oh, governments are accountable to their electorate, um, businesses are accountable to their shareholders and you folks in the NGO sector are not accountable to anybody and you have a free ride. Firstly, I think it's important to recognize that the, the debate is much more nuanced than that. There is an inbuilt accountability mechanism in the reality of NGOs, one that I call the perform or perish principle, which basically, whereas as a government you are entitled to collect taxes, and whether you do well or whether you do really crap, you still can collect the taxes. 
businesses, as, as we've seen repeatedly, some of the most underperforming CEOs get the biggest bonuses um, and, and so on. And they seem to have an ability, only recently it's been impacted, to actually leverage humongous amounts of money for their activities. Whereas with NGOs, for every single uh, cent that they receive, they don't, do not receive it on the basis of obligation. CEDA is not obligated to fund any of its partners. Uh, which it currently funds, or any other foundation and so on. If you do not perform, and that is a really powerful principle. Is it sufficient? No, it isn't. And it's not uh, sufficient. And I just want to say, because I realized from chatting with the panel, some of the panelists earlier, that there might be an information deficit about how much of work has gone on. I should tell you that Greenpeace, for example, together with a range of the biggest international NGOs, under the leadership of Civicus, and I'm happy to see right at the back the Secretary General of Civicus, Danny, you should just wave your hand so people can come and ask you from Sri Lanka. Uh, they led a, a process which ended up in something called the International NGO Accountability Charter. Mm -hmm. And that is a charter that any of you can go onto the website, read it, we report on it on an annual basis. And that was something we did as an act of voluntary accountability so that we would say to the world, these are the standards by which you must judge us by. So the, okay. the only concern I have with the accountability issue and our governments and certain foundations have sought to engage with it is that I think to a large extent it's been very technocratic and technicist. Um, and, and all I would say is that we need to remind ourselves of a very powerful quotation from Albert Einstein when he once said, not everything that counts can be measured and not everything that can be measured counts. Right. right? And we need okay. to understand yeah. that the process of consultation, uh, sorry, uh, of accountability and so on is more process rather than individual sort of moments of product delivery. And Thank Ken you. has a brief comment. Yeah, I mean, very much along the lines of what Kumi was saying, I, there are various kinds of accountability. I mean, one of the simplest kind, you know, you're accountable to your boss. If you don't do your job, you can get fired. I mean, that's one form that everybody's familiar with. Um, another form which governments like to talk about, and Kumi just alluded to this, is accountability to an electorate. Um, you know, the governments say, we were elected, therefore we're accountable. There's a problem with that kind of accountability. It's a very important one, but it has its limits. Um, first of all, electoral accountability is, by definition, majoritarian accountability. But what if what you want to do is promote a minority point of view? Is there no legitimacy to that? You need something other than just kind of majority votes if your aim is to promote something that's not the majority point of view. The other problem with elections is that they're a very crude instrument. I mean, I just voted in a presidential election in the United States, and, you know, I, I like Obama, but I, I also disagree with certain things. But I, can only, I had one vote, so I may dislike his Guantanamo policy and dislike his policy on torture, but like other things. You're, you're sort of stuck with that. What you need to supplement that is civil society and the press, the ability to sort of debate issues in between elections in much more refinement than your one vote every four years permits you. So that's really the third kind of accountability, which I think is what applies most to NGOs, <clears throat> and that is an accountability to public opinion. It requires you to be transparent so people know what you are, but then as Kumi was putting it, it's sort of you, you, you perform or you perish. Um, once people know what you're doing, they either like it and the press writes well about it and donors come to you, or they dislike it and you're criticized and you're not supported. Um, but I think that that sort of com competition in the public marketplace of ideas and opinions is in essence, it's a third and, and it really the only form of accountability that in the end NGOs have. You know, We all know yeah, how to okay. say we're, we're accountable to some people out there, but what you need is really that public opinion to, to hold you to account. Yeah, and there again, I think often the press doesn't do its job. There are some extremely well or overpaid NGO CEOs. There are NGOs that basically are, are a family-run way of sending money off to your relatives who work in the NGOs. And it may be that we, we simply we need to have more transparency requirements and we need the press to do a better job. But this this point that the purpose of an NGO much like in a market, not everybody wants the same brand of toothpaste, not everybody wants the same brand of president, but they're stuck with it. But if you want a different brand of minority p viewpoint or you want to uphold something that's not generally popular, that's, that's where it works. 
uh, so we're, we're ready to do some audience questions. I mean, th there's also a lot more to be said about how, how this accountability works. You take somebody like WikiLeaks, which was not accountable to anybody. Uh, it raised money. Uh, Julian Assange went off and became kind of crazy. Um, then it was unable to raise money. Then other people started donating money. So it's, there's the short term and the long term, both in terms of measuring impact and in terms of how accountability works. So, sorry, yeah. sir, I, I, I think uh, it would be inappropriate for me to not respond to the use of the word crazy. Uh, because, as Albert Einstein once said, that... You really like him. Yes. Yeah. Uh, today, today I like him. Maybe tomorrow I'll be quoting uh, uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu more. <laughs> but any idea that is not absurd and crazy at the outset is not actually worth uh, pursuing. So I don't know Julian Assange. Uh, I do. I, uh, I don't know WikiLeaks itself, but however... Sweden does. I will... <laughs> yes, I know Sweden does. Uh, as well as however, however, sensitive, sensitive. however, I think it's really important that we recognize, make a distinction between the vision and mission of what an organization has, has been doing and any faults that there might be in leaders like ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think the purpose of WikiLeaks is a purpose that we must defend. I hold no brief for them, but the fact that our governments operate with a level of lack of transparency and get away with torture, murder, and terrorism around the world is not acceptable. I mean, you know, uh, and look at the way that the young soldier that leaked the information is being treated. Yeah. I mean, it is abominable. It's absolutely abominable, and that's why, much like uh, Ken, you know, President Obama, when he was elected, you know, I didn't sleep for like three days, and then it's been coming down like mm -hmm. that. And that's why today you have posters coming out where you have a picture of Martin Luther King where it says, I have a dream, and you have a picture of Barack Obama where it says, I have a drone, which, <laughs> which, which is one of the worst human rights yeah. violations. Okay. I think we need so, to challenge so, you a bit because yeah. there's so many... I mean, you, you and then I want that's to fantastic. You. Can yeah. I just say that one of the challenges for the NGO sector is that a governmental agency like CEDA, we are actually prioritizing today to, fu to give funds to NGOs who does net activism, who are active in, tr in really working for freedom of expression in this new landscape. And we are more interested in getting to know that uh, them more than we are interested in getting just the traditional same service delivery proposals from actors not being complementary, but being kind of old-fashioned. So we are very curious to what is in this new landscape. So I'm challenging you. I want to raise a question about accountability. And, and let me ask you, Ken, you're in the business of Human Rights Watch. Suppose it was 1943, somebody came to you and said, I would like to go murder Hitler. Uh, would you have been able to support him? Or are there some things that people need to do who are unaccountable that society cannot do? Well, I, I think <clears throat> any organization has its mandate. So, you know, Human Rights Watch doesn't fight wars. And um, doesn't kill people. Doesn't okay. kill people. You know, so I, I think, you know, maybe our role in a situation like that would be to assess is that a fair thing to do or not? And obviously, you know, Hitler in the midst of a genocide and, and leading a, a war is a combatant. He was a legitimate military target. So, um, you know, in that sense, if somebody wanted to go out there and try to fire at him, it's, it's no different from, you know, shooting at a general on the other side. Those are, you know, that's what the Geneva Conventions adopted after the Second World War say. But so you, you have to sort of, I mean, part of accountability is accountability to what principles, what standards. And um, you know, for, for Human Rights Watch, we're very clear, it's international human rights and humanitarian law, which then actually gives you an answer to the Hitler kind of question, even if we're not going to be the actor. OK, thank you. I just wanted to bring that out. Uh, can you please bring the gentleman in the front row? And if you don't mind saying, unless you're uh, a, a principled anonymous person, say who you are.
We're, we're trying to censor this gentleman, clearly. Hello? <laughs> Thank you. Michele Ozan from UCHAM European Chamber, an organization representing businesses. We are also an NGO because we are an international organization, new, but uh, we redistribute resources. NGOs are, we all know, are, um, we are complementing and also correcting the action of governments, of states. So we redistribute resources, redistribute, uh, every NGO redistribute resources. It will be the work of the activists, members, and money got from donations. Regarding donation and money, I have two important issues. Questions. Regarding financing. Questions, right? Yeah. Receiving donations from donors with questionable ethical background. Even states, some states have questionable ethical background. Yes. And the second one, how to deal when collecting donation implies too high administrative, or let's say, of commission costs. I've heard about huge NGOs giving more than 50% commission to the people knocking doors, asking for money. So how do we tackle with these problems? Ken, Ken wants to take it and then other people? I mean, those are both important questions. I think that, um, I mean, every organization has to set its own standards here. Mine, we're actually very careful about who we take money from. Um, first of all, we don't take money from any government. Um, we would never take money from CEDAW because we, are, um, we need to be independent of governments. So that's one standard we set. When it comes to private individuals, we won't take money from people who have been complicit in human rights violations because that would be hypocritical. As so we, defined by you. Well, I mean, but defined by international standards, but then with our, I mean, we investigate it. Okay. So we do due diligence on, on our donors. In terms of the question, you know, how efficient is your fundraising? There are, there are broad standards, but I think that that's frankly something that donors should ask about and look to, and, and those are for the most part published. But you, you know, if you see an organization that is paying 50%, you know, 50 cents to raise a dollar, that's not a very good investment, and that's probably not a good place for you to put your money. So as an informed donor, those are precisely the kind of questions you want to ask. Jim. Um, I, I, talking from my perspective, I, I think one of the, the things that I really like about um, being in a profit with purpose business is that we are, we are, we are very accountable to, to, to our, our, our investors and we're, we're deeply regulated by the kinds of investors uh, that we can accept uh, and, and, and there's a whole range of, of, of requirements that are, are regulatory requirements that we, we have to to comply, to comply with. And I guess one of the concerns that I have for, the, for, for, for NGOs and, and for the future of NGOs is that they don't, there doesn't seem to be the same level of regulation, uh, overt regulation, as there is in the private sector. And I, I can understand, you know, the private sector has been hauled over the coals and, and, and rightly so over the last uh, decade at least. But I think that's one of the, the, the really big challenges that the NGO sector has. I think the other point that you raise, I, I think, is another real challenge with, with NGOs, which is you know, the, the, the raising of, 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 of money. And I think, um, I think that is a, a major problem in, 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 in the model, because the leadership of NGOs, I mean, that was certainly my own experience, spends an enormous amount of time raising money, and this is often very distracting from running the business uh, because there is no model. But I, I don't see any particular way around that because ultimately it's a, it's, it's a non-profit and it has to, to raise funds. But I, I do think that that is a, a, a real challenge with the, with, with the model. Um, I, I want to expand a little bit on what you said. Um, not accepting donations from somebody who has maybe a criminal record. Um, there's also donors that have certain agendas that you know are not illegal in any ways, but could preclude you from accepting the donation. So, for instance, in my case, uh, my organization does not accept donations if they're coming from an organization that has a religious base or a political base, because we don't want our hospital to be hijacked by other interests. Um, that was a cautious decision that we made, and it's 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 in our charter. Um, for the second issue that you raise in terms of the commission, uh, it has caused me no grief, and, and I totally agree with, with, um, with Jim. Um, we, we spend 60%, 70% of the time just raising funds, and, and I have been in situations where um, 
I had to put my own credit card on the line. I have to incur expenses. And the regulatory schemes that I have around me didn't, didn't allow me to work around it. And it, it constrains me a lot. And I unfortunately don't know the answer, if there's anything that we could do better. Can I just? Uh, Come in. Oops, sorry. Uh, at Greenpeace, uh, we also don't take a cent from government or business for the similar reasons that uh, Ken mentioned. We, we don't take money from any business entity either because the reality is we have campaigns against more than 50% of the companies that are attending the World Economic Forum, for example, at the moment. <laughs> uh, it would make it a bit. But on this issue of, on this issue of costs, uh, I do think it is a very complicated issue. Uh, and there are some very objectionable practices, such as, in a few cases, it's being done away with, where a fundraiser gets paid on commission, so that you know an NGO leader would tell you, "I need you to raise a million," and the person goes, and 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 then there's sort of a percentage split, and all. Now that was dominant in certain parts of the United States, in particular. That's been. Uh, eroded. But when I think of how we raise money, which is engaging what we call direct dialogue, it does cost us money to have activists on the street, but I, I always go out. These are the most hardworking people in Greenpeace, by the way, the ones who are on the streets. And I, went, I always go out with them when I'm on the field. And when I look at that 20-minute conversation that they have with a person that stops to have a conversation with them, it's not a fundraising thing in itself all the conversation leading up to the fundraising ask is actually a campaigning conversation saying, this is why you should be concerned about forests, oceans, the climate, and so on. Okay. So in that sense, depending how the fundraising is done, even if there are costs, there might be non-fundraising benefits that need to be factored into. So in a sense, what you're saying is, as you fundraise, you're also delivering part of your mission. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, go ahead, and then I want to ask whether That's people think... That's a very good model. Uh, maybe to, to make this more complicated, some of the fundraising is being done in, in, in the North Hemisphere for the South Hemisphere. And what I've seen too much of is that uh, the fundraising is, is built up on, on good communication, good or bad communication. Uh, and it's about perception. Uh, the, the donor, and I'm not talking about an agency, I'm talking about a private individual who decides where to put a pound. Uh, it's very much, um, there is no, there is hard, it's hard to, to actually distinguish who is doing a better job. Because what we know is who's doing the best communication. Because what's being done is done very far from you. And it's hard to judge. And I fear that some of the organizations are putting more money in fundraising strategies and communication strategies than they do in, and excuse me for the word, in product development or solution development. Because as, and, and I'm, I'm challenging this, as long as we have a north-south, as long as the donor is far away from the delivery situation, that's a danger. Because then that can continue, because nobody's challenging, well, what is actually work, what does, what works? Right. At the field level. And that's what we want to know as a donor, not how good you are in communicating. And, and, and yeah. I think that's very, very important to, to challenge. So if I were to start a charity, it might be one that was devoted to creating more transparency mm -hmm. at the point of delivery yeah. for, for, for many of these things. Uh, because please, please do some due diligence before you set up that NGO, because there's at least about 10 organizations that are doing that in different parts of the no, world. No, no, I'm, I'm, talking about, <laughs> I'm talking about press, actually. Yeah, yeah. Again, press. journalists, ah. real journalists. But just a, a quick poll, and then this lady here had a question. Um, so who thinks, and we'll ask the audience as well, who thinks commissions are inherently wrong as a way to raise money? You, 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 you certainly. I, I, I think. Uh, can I suggest maybe mm. that I, I apologize. That's too strong. There's a very no, no. There's a very minor issue. There are bigger issues, mm. and I'm sure the audience. No, no. Has, but I mean, it's yeah. it's interesting. Mm. It, it, like, yeah, I, I, if I commissions are effective, are they immoral? I don't know. I, don't, I mean, yeah. I just don't think we should blindly dismiss them. Yeah, actually, I don't use them, but I don't think they're immoral. I, you know, it's just there's just another form of compensation, mm -hmm. and as long as they're not excessive with respect to the amount raised. I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with yeah. it. Okay. The, problem, the problem is when there's no gaps, uh, no, yeah. no limits put, 
Um, okay, sorry, it's just my job to make yeah. you accountable yeah. to yeah. your yeah, yeah. wild statements. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Kavita Ramdas, and I'm the oh. Ford Foundation representative in New Delhi and ran a nonprofit organization, the Global Fund for Women, for many years in San Francisco prior to this. I just want to say, I think, particularly being at Davos in the context of this you know, extraordinary private wealth and the discussion around the private sector, and then this discussion about the NGO sector, I find it kind of um, somewhat disingenuous. There's a huge amount of pressure on the nonprofit sector to become more efficient and more businesslike. Mm -hmm. Yet when we use strategies, including good communications, including getting commissions, including paying our, um, our best staff the kind of salaries that actually would attract terrific people, then the for-profit sector suddenly turns around and says, oh my goodness, what are these people doing? You know, they are not Mother Teresa, they are not Mahatma Gandhi, they should be doing this for the service of the poor. And on the issue of looking at the question of delivery on the ground, you have no idea how social change happens. Whether you are sitting in New Delhi and you're looking at this young girl being raped, and you're seeing what has happened on the streets, and you see 7,000, 8,000, 10,000 people pouring onto the streets, you don't actually know whether the grant that you made to 20 women's organizations over the last 20 years, which has built a capacity, it really doesn't matter whether you're there or not necessarily. I, I think it makes you feel better. It makes you think that, you know, but honestly, rich people, no matter where they are, whether they're in New Delhi or whether they're in New York, are not inclined to go walking around the streets of Harlem or to go to the bastis of Delhi to look and see what is actually happening. So let's be very careful when we talk about what it means when we're expecting NGOs to deliver on a set of accountability structures on which we don't actually hold either government or the private sector to anything close to the same standard. And then lastly with regard... <laughs> And then lastly, with regard to, you know, money, an old friend of mine, a community organizer in Chicago once said, taint no such thing as tainted money, it just taint enough. <laughs> and what is tainted money? Ken cannot take money from a uh, government or from certain, you know, companies that invest in arms. But do we know where rich people make their money from? Do we know that each of us who work for even foundations like Ford or MacArthur or Gates, how our money is invested? What kinds of companies, what kind of behavior? You think private equity is okay? Do you really know what kinds of investments, the mining companies that are coming to India today that are completely destroying our earth and our you know, basic resources that the Indian government is saying FDI, fantastic, foreign direct investment. So let's be careful when we use these words. I would just encourage us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jim, Jim wants to respond, yes. then I have a comment. Uh, just, just to be absolutely clear, I'm not saying private equity is okay. Uh, I'm saying uh, the particular social investment fund that we do, which is based on a private equity model, does good, uh, and we measure impacts, and we ensure that good happens. Uh, that, that, that's, the, that, that's the assertion I'm making. Um, for what it's worth, Pierre Omidyar, the founder of eBay, uh, created a huge fortune and started funding nonprofits and discovered it just was too complicated. There were too many regulations about what you could and couldn't do and how you kept your books and if you did such and such a thing, you were lo no longer not for profit. He said, screw it. I'm a business guy. I'm going to invest in companies that do good for profit. Maybe we won't be quite as profitable, but we're simply going to have more freedom to do what we like. And I, I see that happening more and more perhaps mostly in the U.S., but anyway, there's a question. I mean, there's a but, limit to that. I mean, yeah, of course there is. First of all, Pierre, you know, at the same time, has Humanity United, which funds Human Rights Watch and lots of NGOs. So he does both things. But um, the idea that, you know, for-profit is going to give the answer, you can't do what Human Rights Watch does for profit. No. There's lots of things you just can, well, you, if you insist on a profit, it's never gonna happen. Yeah. So you gotta accept that certain things just require an NGO sector. Yeah. Absolutely, I think, I mean, when I come to the conclusion of this panel, it's going to be there's no single answer, there's no simple answer, there are lots of different ways to do it, corruption shows up anywhere. Uh, David, and then the man in the red shirt, and then the guy in the suit there. 
who must be a business guy because he's wearing a suit. <laughs> David. I, I'm never comfortable at this sort of point in a discussion when somebody says there's no answer. Uh, of course, there are answers no single. to every issue. Yes, there's no single answer. But it is worth dwelling for a moment on what Kavita Ramdas just said about, in a way, the purpose of activities within civil society and perhaps even the purpose of action within societal movements of all kinds. Uh, many of us who've been active in this area have learnt that there is a tendency on the part of those who provide resources, be they foundations or governments or businesses, to want to be able to come out with a very simple purpose statement of what the resources will deliver. And indeed there's a degree of skewing that goes on so that easily measurable deliverables, sorry about the syllables, get prioritized often in funding discourse. Especially if there are anxieties about the governance and therefore also the money handling capacity of, a, of an entity. But the transformations that occur, for example, in Sahel, where societies are being stressed by recurrent droughts and difficult politics, the transformations that occur are often not led by governments who are eligible for monies from donors. They're not led by institutions who can open a dialogue with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation easily. They're led by very informal groups of extraordinary people who are the real transformers. And so I'm kind of interested in really teasing out some of these issues. The world will transform in a better place through the actions of some of the most humble and invisible agents for social change and not through big intergovernmental NGOs with lots of accountants who can show where every penny has gone. Mm. And so for me, and why I was so pleased to be on this panel, yes, there, there aren't answers, but there are really interesting ways to frame the questions. Thank you very much, Kavita. Thanks, and, and new models. Yeah. Charlotte. I said in the beginning that I wanted to talk about exit strategies, and it's actually uh, has to do with the role of an INGO. Because the re reality and rhetoric has been for so many years that uh, the role has been to build capacity in a country. Uh, and, and if you're true to that mission, you, 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 there, you, know, you have to come sooner or later to a situation where you're not, I mean, you're successful, so you're not needed. Uh, but are you... Um, true to your mission enough to actually plan for an exit? Are you true to your mission enough to say the international added value in the chain of, of cooperation is not adding any value any longer because there's so many other actors, there's technology, there's so many other things taking place. So we actually don't need to be here. And, and I don't know if that, you know, if that's happening, that's discussion enough. And if it's and if we are challenging some of the, the international NGOs, and obviously a, a governmental agency can enter that dis debate and discussion and, and, and pro provoke that discussion uh, with an open mind, kind of. And, so. and with some humility as well. Of course, right? and that's Beca what I, because, yes. Because the, yes. issue, the issue is, where is your accountability? Yes. Your accountability is to your government. Your government's, uh, I mean, CEDA is a government agency. Yes, true, absolutely. The government, uh, what we have as a problem in the developing world is that what is often put to us as philanthropy, cooperation, and so on is actually serving the agenda of that government, advancing yes. its own interests. Right. And I can give you examples of Sweden and South Africa around certain arm yeah. deals and so on, mm -hmm. which were part of how the conversations actually happened. So I absolutely fully in, uh, encourage that you have a voice in this mm -hmm. conversation. Absolutely, and I think it's a good provocation to us but I do think w the starting point has to be saying, well, actually, my own basis of entering this conversation is actually on pretty shallow ground,
because, in fact, my starting point is my accountability is to a government which is uh, open Fair to enough. the vagaries of and elections. imperfect. Yeah. Fair yeah. enough. Uh, Jim, quickly, yeah, and then and the man sure. in the red shirt. I, I, the I guess for me the, the, the challenge has been that there has been an enormous spotlight placed on the private sector, and rightly so. So, you know, you can open up the newspaper, you know, any, any newspaper any day in the last 10 years, and if there's a story about, but you know, there'll be invariably be some story about, you know, a, a, a business that's... Uh, you know, done something, done something wrong, and cheated the public, and okay, lied. So and, and, sorry, to, to get the point. And I, I, I think that there's been relatively little light shone on NGOs and their activities. I, I think it's been predominantly on the private sector. I think it's been predominantly on governments. Uh, I think that there's an assumption that NGOs are the good guys, and I, I don't think that's good for the NGO sector. The man in the red shirt. If you speak in yes. Sie sprechen auf Deutsch, in können, okay. First of all, I want to say NGO means non-governmental. If an organization receives money from the government, it's not an NGO anymore. Secondly, uh, Krishnamurti, an Indian philosopher, said as soon as a good idea gets institu institutionalized, it, be it becomes corrupt. Third, the moderator said uh, that we can ask questions in a democracy, we, the civil society also can make comments. Then this, the next point is, if we say how much money we give to the South, we also have to say how much the South is paying to us. Correct. For example, the third world is paying three times more interest than we are investing in so-called help business. This is just a shame on us, and it's all together with with tax evasion and all this, it's more than 10 times more what the poor are paying to us. So this is a business with poverty. It's unacceptable. And I think today we should focus not only where the money is going to, we have to focus also what are we doing? Which kind of strategies? Are we only tack tacking, tackling uh, the symptoms or are, are we all also tackling the causes of the problems? For example, the plan if, uh, family planning because of population growth, or also uh, what are we doing that the money of the rich is not growing in an exponential way? And as a last point, I want to say private equity. Private trans is a Latin name and it means stealing. Um, thank you for your comments. Uh, now the, the other guy in the suit there. Uh, thank you. Hi, my name is Mark Tursik. Um, I run the Nature Conservancy. We're a big international NGO. So I, I may be biased here because I do want to defend NGOs. But um, I've been in this role for five years. Prior to that, I spent 25 years on Wall Street. So um, I actually am, have spent, invested more of my life in the private sector. I'd like to defend NGOs and, and object to some of the generalities that I've heard from the stage today. I don't think, I th I don't think Pierre Omidyar Esther has really criticized NGOs or nonprofits as organizations that no, can't no. get things He's done. He's criticized the regulations that Whatever. restricted him. The from, implication no, I, of just, your comment, though, I object to, no. because I wish people would pick their words more carefully, because your comment suggested that he chose instead to invest for profits because he could get more done. I don't think his own actions support that comment. The suggestion that there's no scrutiny or disclosure of NGOs, I think, is absurd. I'm most familiar with NGOs headquartered in the United States. We disclose, to qualify for our tax-exempt status, we provide ample financial disclosure. It's available if you're interested. The suggestion that we spend too much money communicating to me is absurd. Our job is to run our organizations. We have to run, raise a lot of money, to be sure. It's hard to do. Most f funders encourage us to communicate more clearly what we're accomplishing. Indeed, your own question suggests if we knew more about the results of what you were happen accomplishing, that would be helpful. That's what we seek to do through our communications. Um, the folks need to understand, funders sometimes su suggest, and, and a comment came up on the stage, it's hard to know what's happening. Yes, you know, there's an investing side to the world. Investors invest in private sector companies. They work hard to understand what the companies they invest in are accomplishing. They look at the financial disclosures and work their way through that to understand that. They pay attention. They, some funders prefer one kind of company, investors, others and other ones. Great. Uh, there's glib comments made, oh, the big international NGOs are the bad ones. They should exit more. Others say small NGOs are the good ones. All these NGOs that are surviving 
are working hard. It's not easy raising money. They're probably, on the, by and large, doing good things. And the criticism, general criticism, is really not that useful. Rather, be specific. If you have ideas on how NGOs can do their job better, that's very helpful. If you're a funder and you have ideas for how to improve, let us know. But general criticisms, disclosure should be better, too much time is spent on communication, what should the right commission be for fundraising? Um, I don't see those sorts of questions recklessly being applied in the private sector. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, finally, this woman that I'm pointing to here in the third row. Thank you. And please also let us know who you are. Thank you. My name is Michelle Arevalo Carpenter. Um, I'm the Overseas Operations Director of a small but growing NGO. It's called Asylum Max as we uh, advocate for the rights of refugees in the developing world. And my question, I, I'm hoping to, to insert a, one layer that I was hoping to hear more of today is the generational layer. Um, okay. Our NGO is only six years old. And in the, over the first year, the CEO was also the envelope stuffer was also the receptionist. And accountability uh, in the US, anywhere else, is expensive, even if it's uh, paid with, uh, with resources, with time. There's only so many hours we can really work. How can we work together as, as a sector to, to give each other a stronger holding hand uh, for the next generation of NGOs to, to flourish? Um, that's my okay. question. Thanks. So let me, let me take this question and embellish it slightly more. Uh, she talked about generations, and I think this is probably both generations of individuals, young people, uh, generations of organizations, startup NGOs. Uh, how is the world different when you can start an international NGO using the Internet in a very different way? How is it different when you can have a website and show what your hospital is doing to somebody in... Minneapolis, uh, someone... If you yeah. take that great question and put it in the context of the topic, which is NGOs as new models in the 21st century, okay, I'm going to shock a lot of people now, but I would say that NGOs as we currently exist are not new models for the new century. We have run out of steam. In, if we continue, you've put your finger on a very important issue the aging of the NGO sector, right? No, seriously. I mean, I, if I look at Greenpeace, when Greenpeace started, the average age of Greenpeace leadership then and what we are now, I won't give you the figure because I don't have the exact one and I don't want to be held accountable for it, but I want to make the most controversial comment, uh, provocative comment about where we are and why we must be consistent in the light of the la last uh, comment as well. The World Economic Forum is an NGO, right? We say, as one of our values, and I know I might not be invited back next year, but I'm going to say this because I've, I, I think it must be said. One of the things we say is that we don't want our leaders in government or even in business to stay in position for too long. That we should have a culture that says no human being is in indispensable. That people come, they serve one term, two terms, and they move on. Is it... Why, yeah, we're having a conversation about NGOs. Why don't we ask the question? Professor Klaus Schwab, somebody who I like and respect, but he runs the risk of becoming the Robert Mugabe of the NGO sector in terms of the length of service that he is. No, no, if you want to use language, let's talk about it in an honest way because nobody should have a culture of, because part of what is lacking in NGOs, and I would say including my own, is we do not have a culture of succession planning, of opening up av avenues of new people coming in. And if we continue like that, I certainly don't want this to be the new model for the 21st century. We need to open up spaces and be more open. And I recommend all of you who are interested in the sub subject to buy a book called Spider and the Starfish. Because a spider is hierarchically structured as most NGOs are. You cut its head, a spider dies. A starfish which is what your question talks about the social media, because Occupy and all of these new movements, they have actually had more, the Arab Spring. Eh? No NGO really can claim that they were 
big part of the Arab Spring. We might have helped here and there of, or, or along the years, but that was a starfish, you know, a starfish, you cut off one of those thingamajigs, it grows back and grows into another starfish, and you know, take uh, uh, your archetypal starfish organization of the past was Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, nobody knows who's the founder, where it's headquartered, and so on, but every community you go to anywhere in the world, people are following the same 12-step program. And that's what we need. We need organizations and movements that are not, that's the new models we need. Mm -hmm. Highly centralized just doesn't work in a new social media context. I'm, I'm not quite sure if, if you were being hopeful or not, but uh, I, I, I guess I represent the young generation here. Um, and and uh, I, I, I see a lot more good things happening in the world. I know there's lots of problems in NGOs, and all of you here have dedicated your lives and careers to it. I, I'm barely starting in my career, but uh, I, I'm just going to use my own example since that's the one I know. Uh, I couldn't have done what I did five years ago. All these new tools that exist have allowed me to collaborate with thousands and thousands of people spread all over the world. And I also want to recommend a book, uh, The Dragonfly Effect. You can read about it. It's essentially the thesis is that um, the same action multiplied across lots and lots of people can create a giant movement. And we saw that happening in Egypt, and I'm, I'm more hopeful than you on, on, on that front. Um, but I do see new models coming. I am seeing the NGO world uh, at least in my generation, the, the 20s and the 30s, people are actually thinking about planning and succession, and they are uh, adding governance. And, and uh, m maybe, maybe what we need is, is look a little bit more at the young people. So I'll, I'll leave it with that hope here. Yeah, there, there, there are two approaches to this. One is succession planning, perhaps, and the other is simply the world is getting more decentralized and it's much harder to stay in power whether you're a large company, a large press institution. Uh, governments tend to persist longer because they have monopoly powers like Mugabe, uh, but a lot of things are being eroded around the edges. It's just simply one person has much more power now. And Ken had a comment. Um, when, when I grew up, there was a, an ice cream shop in town which would have a, a new flavor of the month, every month. And so they'd have all the regular flavors, but they have a new one. And this was sort of the, the exciting new thing that everybody wanted to have. And sometimes discussions about NGOs are a little like the flavor of the month because there are these enthusiasms out there. You know, today small is better. You know, young is better. Social media is better. And it's, um, there's always an element of truth to that. I mean, the flavor of the month was often good. But um, you've got to be a little bit more savvy and pragmatic about that. Um, let's, you know, we, we grant, for example, in the human rights realm, local human rights groups are a very important part of, of the protective device where we try to defend rights. But if you sort of abolish the international groups, then you would have, what, you know, thousands of people in Brussels, each for their little NGO, trying to influence EU policy in a positive direction direction and thousands more at UN headquarters. And you know, obviously, you can't do this. They can never afford it to be completely inefficient. There are ways in which um, it's more efficient and more effective to have an NGO group involved in that. Or you know, take social media. I mean, I, I love social media. I'm a big fan. There's a lot of knowledge and intelligence that just you know, trickles up through the network. But what social media often lacks is the ability to develop in-depth expertise over time. So if I want, for example, an expert on human rights in Uzbekistan, somebody who you know, has been following it for years, who really understands how awful it is, what the pressure points are, how we can change things, you know, yeah, I could ask social media, and I might get a right answer, I might get a wrong answer. You don't get the kind of depth of expertise that you need. So you look to social media for certain things. It's a great way to kind of collect common wisdom. It's a great way to get the word out. But it's not necessarily a great way to develop you know, long-term, in-depth expertise. So I just, my, my advice is, when you hear the flavor of the month, be a little bit wary. You know, there's probably an element of truth in it, but it's rarely the panacea. It's rarely the sole answer. When did you go home last? To the flavor of the month? Do they, yeah, do they do have they the flavor of the week yet? Yeah, I know, probably have yeah, the flavor of the minute. Yeah, right. Jim, and then there's a question right in the middle of the, yeah. actually there's two. So. I guess, Ken, you know, notwithstanding, I think you're right, there, 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 there are trends. 
I, I, I do, though. I, I'm quite sort of sympathetic to, to, to Kumi's point, that there does, at least in my experience of you know, working you know, for many decades uh, in, in the NGO sector, there, there, there is this absolute trend of, of, of leaders staying, particularly in the more prominent NGOs, uh, fairly much forever. And I, I think the NGO sector sort of needs to understand that when the public sees that, it, it, it begs questions of accountability, and, and there's no real way uh, around that. I mean, it may be that they are the best placed person to be there, and that there's democratic processes that have put them in that place, but it doesn't look good. Okay. Um, so we're going to change the format slightly, because I see too many hands being raised. Uh, would those who'd like to ask questions just line up over there because I want to make sure we hear each question or comment before the end and if you all see how many people are behind you that will encourage you to keep your your comments your questions or your responses short so if you'd like to talk in the mic do just make your way over there slowly and we we will get everybody if possible before two o'clock uh, sorry for the disruption but I think it's the best way uh, so let's let's take the first person hand them the mic and we will respond but we'll try and be brief too she says encouragingly go ahead my name is Sari Rifkin I'm the executive director of ED the Association of Community Empowerment and a Schwa Foundation social entrepreneur um, the, my first uh, I, have, I have two uh, statements or comments the first is that um, Way back when, um, we talked about non uh, NGOs, nonprofit organizations, accountability being their board. There's a board of, of directors, and uh, and in Mer er the American model, the board of directors also uh, invest uh, financially in the um, organization. I have heard nothing here with all the outside um, agitators that have to uh, see what we're doing. What uh, the, the discussion, what's the role of the board of directors and aren't they those that make us um, uh, uh, accountable? The second um, question that I also have is, I think that the, uh, the, the real question of NGOs for the, the next two decades is what is our funding strategy going to be? I see that foundation funding is is drying up. Um, uh, the Ford Foundation and many other foundations have left the human rights field in Israel, giving up on on, um, on the cause that can never change. Um, and and if we want to continue doing our work, we need to look at other models models of earned income. And I'd like to hear your your thoughts on that as well. Okay. And so what we're going to do is is collect all these questions. I'm writing them down, and uh, we'll address them. My name is Cyril Altier from Sahi Foundation here in Davos. And I would like to ask especially to Mr. Ross and probably Mr. Naidu or others who uh, discussed the issue of uh, NGO, a new area. Uh, somebody, something coming could be coming after the NGO area. So would it be possible that this is going towards the area of social private equity? Is that the new big wave and not just the flavor of the month. Or maybe a new, whatever. okay, so keep that in mind. I mean, I we'll can answer briefly, but sure, then we'll I, I can only really just, just sort of repeat what, what Ken said. I mean, they're, they're, they're just simply things that, you know, the, the private sector won't do and, and can't be done for profits. You know, watching human, human rights abuses, uh, it, it's hard to see how you could turn a profit on that. Uh, you know, holding holding businesses and, 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 and governments accountable for uh, global warming and, and environmental disasters. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to see how you could turn a profit on that. So I just think they're things that, that, that are simply not going to be done on a, on a, on a for-profit basis. And I, I can't see any way of, of accomplishing those absolutely critical things and that, that, that we need to do without a, a non-profit sector. Thanks. Next question. My name is Zubaida Bai. I'm from India, and I'm the founder of a maternal health organization called EYES. I think we represent the really niche part of the social enterprise sector, which is like the for-profit social enterprises. 
And I can claim that we are only, we're the only for-profit maternal health entity. Now, where do we fit in? Because when we go to foundations, they're like, hey, hello, listen, you're not a non-profit. And when we go to private equity, they're like, you don't make the amount of money that we actually want you to make. But we are doing it in the most sustainable manner, selling products that cost 2 to $5 for maternal and neonatal health in India and Africa over the last two years and slowly growing. So where does people like us, like where do we fit in? What We are accountable, we are not non-profit, but we are achieving MDG 4 and 5. So what is it that this next wave of generation that is niche looking out for? Okay, yeah, briefly, go ahead. Um, well, I'm happy yeah. to speak to you afterwards. I, I have some contacts I can put you where people are doing that. But essentially the difficulty you have is what you have is an hybrid organization. And the way some others have dealt with it is that they have actually segmented the two sides of the operations. So what they do is they consciously have a non-profit arm registered in terms of non-profit law, complying with all of those laws and so on. And then they have a um, what's called an enterprise arm or the for-profit arm. And that then conforms to operations. Now, I don't know the, dis the details of your operation. It might not be that easy to do. But I do think that this is a good challenge for us to have. Yeah. And it's a good challenge for us to apply ourselves to. And I'm very glad that you raised it. Because I think over the next decade, we're going to see more and more of your kind of organization emerging. And I'd like to, to just echo that, because I, and, and also I think that what NGOs has done is probably to inspire uh, these new, new models that we see. So we should take the credit for that there are other things growing out of that. And, and, and when an agency like ours is, is trying to be a good partner in the country, we are actually discussing solutions and not, and not to start with, is, is it an NGO or is it this or that? Uh, and, and I think that's going to happen more and more, that we are actually looking for the goods. And that's what I mean by communication strategies. Be clear on, on, on ways of working rather than nice pictures of children, if I may. Uh, and, and so that's the whole idea that, around that. And I, I also want to say that we're very, very, very curious around youth and new technologies. And if the old traditional NGOs are not curious about that. Things will change quickly. Okay. So. Um, I also want to add a little bit. Um, I live and work in Silicon Valley. Uh, we believe in hybrid. Anything that doesn't make sense, we take a look at it. And the term that's thrown around for your type of organization there is FOPSIS, for-profit social enterprise. Uh, it's just a term that's thrown out there. Um, but I'm happy to talk more. I, I know that there's social venture capital in the Valley, in Silicon Valley, that does support organizations like, like yours. Yeah, it's, it's worth saying, if you're a public company, you have a duty to investors, and it's, it's really hard to be low profit. But there are lots of private investors who will indeed invest in something that's for profit, but not very. Yeah, sure. I think what I'm trying to say is, yes, we do have, like we raised our first round of investments, so we do have social yeah. investors in our company. We do have the Canadian government giving us a grant as well, but we're trying to figure out how the Indian government is going to let us take the money as a for-profit. It's been a struggle over the last six months. Yeah. It's clearly something that we need to do as a grant, which is like monitor and evaluate the impact that we're doing. But we've been struggling for six months with every accountant, and I've spent a lot, lot of money that we raised as investment in trying to get this grant money in and actually do what we're trying to do. So I think the system has to be ready for it. It's yeah. more about how are people like us going to be supported eventually in future Rather than just think about NGOs and accountability, I think there's more accountability for us taking both investment and grant money. Yeah, this goes back a bit to what I was saying about Pure Omidyar. It's simply sometimes the regulatory constraints are, are very complicated. And one is to take the grant not to the organization, but to have it given to a third party to do something for you. But we're, let's go on to the next few questions. And we will not forget the first question. I wrote it down. My name is Dr. Annie Sparrow. I teach humanitarian aid and human rights at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. And I wanted to raise a question and probably pose it to David and Petri about the fundamental discord between accountability to the beneficiary and the accountability to the donor. Oh. And I say this from the point of view, I used to run 
UNICEF's malaria program in Somalia for the Global Fund, performance-based funding. And I spent a great deal of my time, an enormous amount, accounting everything down to the last cent so I can explain this is what a malaria net costs, this is what it costs to ship to Mombasa, this is what, you know, and it costs, you know, $1.81 cents for a conical net, it costs this much to ship, and then I have to pay the pirate tax, then I have to pay every single checkpoint, and I can explain actually down to the right. last cent how much all the additional checkpoints, corruption, pirates can cost. That's what the Global Fund demands. That takes an enormous amount of time when you're talking about, you know, you're the one, I'm the one who's trying to get service delivery on the ground. And we talk about accountability to the beneficiaries, because that's what we're in it for. At the same time, the beneficiary of the malaria net, you know, I'm only allowed to give malaria nets to people who are going to use them as malaria nets. They might want to use them to pull their house together. They might want to use a fishing net. They might want to use it in any manner of ways. And I agree with that. I think you can do whatever you want with it. If it's useful to you, that's a very, very good thing. You can sell it again. But I think we've really, you know, in some, in some way we've lost the um, why we're actually doing being accountable in the first place. And we're in danger of losing it altogether. And that's really the issue I wanted to raise. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm accountable to the organizers here to finish within 10 minutes to hear all the questions to give each of you a chance to respond very briefly. Uh, we're not trying to answer all these questions, we're trying to raise them. So next three people quickly. Very briefly, my name is yeah. Steve Davis. I'm the president and CEO of PATH, a large global INGO doing uh, technology in global health. Um, but I guess I, I, I rose, raised my hand really in response to a question number, you know, that this, the business model is not evolving. I mean, my view is that they're just as the private sector, and I come out of the private sector, I also came out of the human rights sector, I, I have, um, it, it, all of these sectors, these institutions will survive by evolving. That's no different in the NGO sector than in the private sector. And as a result, we see a lot of very, very smart NGOs doing all sorts of new models, hybrid business models, you know, value for money, methodologies for thinking about how you actually um, move forward. Um, I see succession planning, new generation training. I mean, this is the idea that there's these old NGOs and then the rest of the world, I think is really misguided and doesn't do any of us a service. There's a lot of excellence in, in the sector. What, what, so I, I support my uh, colleague at uh, Nature's Conservancy to say, you know, I'd be careful that these, this language doesn't um, actually support things in a way that we don't intend. The second I would really like to raise, I actually, what the surprising lack in this dialogue that I've heard is not the conversation about the being the sort of facilitator intermediary between sectors. To me, the evolving 21st century problems, a lot are going to come only through cross-sectoral solutions, whether it's how Pierre did it or others. And the, the fundamental role of an NGO can be how to support in a market failure environment new innovation. How do you actually pull the parties together? And, and, and that's actually very powerful, and I haven't heard much of that today. Okay, thank you. And, and let me just note the difference between evolution where individual things die off so that progress is made in general, and learning where individual things learn and change internally. Next question. Thank you, I'll be brief too. Um, I'm uh, Philip Wilson Schwab, social entrepreneur, uh, ex-banker and private uh, equity investor, etc. Um, I have two comments. Uh, my uncle was the president of Guatemala and he was involved in the signing of the peace and he said, the hardest thing for him when he was signing the peace was the NGOs were very difficult and it seemed like they wouldn't perpetuate their existence by not signing the peace. I didn't disagree or disagree, but it was an interesting comment, uh, you know, 15 years ago. 15 years later, I became a social entrepreneur and what I have found, and I don't want to make a blanket statement, there's good and bad NGOs, there's good and bad companies, but what I have found is that the larger the NGOs, the more they're focused on the bureaucracy and less on the mission, and the smaller, in a place like Guatemala, because I only have experience in Central America, the more they're focused on solving the problem and having an exit strategy, which I think was the most important thing said today. So there's a lot of hope out there. Um, you know, our, our mission is to solve the water problem, $35 water for life, and the small NGOs are taking that and running with it. And they're saying, look, we're gonna do this because we know we can reduce the problem of water. 
The bigger NGOs, they buy the filter and give it away, which I don't think is a sustainable, but you know, it's good for their donor base. So I think it's a question of big and small, unfortunately. Um, and the smaller tend to be more solution focused, the bigger, more focused on the bureaucracy, in my experience. Okay, Thank so you. you can go outside and fight. Um, <laughs> last, last question. Peter Prove from the Ecumenical Advocacy Alliance. I'm a member of the Global Agenda Council on the Role of Faith, but also relevantly a member of the Project Steering Group on the Future Role of Civil Society. Just wanted to draw the meeting's attention to the fact that a report, a World Economic Forum report, on uh, this issue, the future role of civil society was released yesterday, and I think it has some innovative uh, thoughts included in it. And one very challenging one, and that is how we can move beyond thinking in sectoral terms, the first, the second, the third sector, but rather think of civil society as the glue that binds private and public action for the common good. And I think that's something we can all reflect on, but civil society itself has to reflect on. The issue will be whether the other sectors are willing to be glued together in this way. One point that came up in a conversation we had this morning uh, was, as much as we want to focus on engaging youth, it must not be at the expense of engaging the ageing demographic, which is an increasingly a global trend. We have to be able to engage older people as well. And uh, finally, on this issue of, uh, of regulation, I think I've heard it from several members on the panel, uh, I think the greatest, one of the greatest threats to civil society at the moment is not the lack of regulation and transparency, but increasingly restrictive and frankly oppressive mm. forms of regulation that is killing the energy and genius of civil society in many parts of the world. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. So is, is the last person a question or just sitting there? No, you're just sitting there. Okay. Um, any, any closing thoughts? Uh, brief ones. <laughs> we, we have the role of the boards and funding. So, David, you... Thanks very much off, indeed. But really, really brief. Uh, just for that last kind of rush of points and questions, uh, I'd just like to suggest that, in a way, the point that came through towards the end, that what matters is the outcome is where we all need to be sitting. Mm. We're all part of a mix of processes involving a variety of different individuals and entities that are seeking outcomes to do with uh, equity, sustainability, dignity, and a number of other key assets for the future of humanity. And that the challenge in thinking about new models is how to continue, as Peter Prove said right at the end, to establish ways in which different groups can work together with minimal transactions for common good. It is difficult, whether it's dealing with disciplinary silos, sectors of government, or simply straightforward difficulties between organisations at interfaces, this is not easy work. And it's work that all of us need to work on and find ways to resolve. For me, the primary new model for the 21st century is not multiple organisations. It's not partnerships. It is movements. Movements that bring together a variety of different entities as if inside a magnetic field working for the same goal with strong metrices and with very tough watchdogs to ensure that they're accountable everywhere because mutual accountability is the only way to go. Thank, Thank you. you. Sh Charlotte, okay, sh but guys, you really have to be brief okay, so because I need to close it. So. David, that was excellent. I endorse everything that you said. Uh, just to respond to very briefly, our conversation, we used interchangeably the word NGO and civil society. Just remind ourselves that NGOs is only a tiny part of civil society. It's trade unions, it's faith-based organizations, it's looser movements, it's social movements, and so on. The second thing is, I think, that last set of comments was guiding us to say that we need to understand that for all the challenges that humanity faces, all sectors have a role to play, government, business, and civil society. The challenge for us is to understand the comparative advantages of different sectors and what they can bring to the table, and they have to do it with something that the women's movement tried to teach us decades ago, but we refused to listen, which is the power of intersectionality, which is to understand how 
race intersects with gender, with class, and so on. And the sooner we learn that, I think, the better we'll stand a chance to secure our children's future and avert catastrophic climate change. Thank you. Charlotte? Um, I think uh, that uh, our colleague here has said what we wanted to say in the end. Uh, I just had one reflection on, on accountability and governments and uh, outcomes are important, uh, but we, we as a government uh, agency, uh, we know that the Swedish public, 85% of the Swedish public wants to show solidarity. Uh, it's not the government, it's, it's actually what they say. And, and we are not there to kind of tell them that every penny is being spent, that this and that. They want to know that, that we show solidarity in outcomes and actions. And I think that some of us in this whole business, we have lost ourselves in bureaucracy. Uh, we really need to go back and think what is important and not become too technocratic. And we have a role to play there. Thank you. So. Uh, what you've heard here, I think, think back to the thing that made you most annoyed, that you thought was most stupid or frustrating or clueless. That's probably the thing you need to pay attention to. Uh, we're all different, have different points of view. There's a lot of interaction. There are good versions of something. There are bad versions of something. There's probably no model good enough to, to overcome bad people. There's probably good people who can do something in, in any, using any model. In the end, it comes down to human spirit, human courage, and transparency. So I, I thank you all for participating. I thank all of you guys for being patient with my telling you to hurry up. Uh, we're done in time, and thank you all very much.